When Rare and Nintendo released GoldenEye for the N64, it defied all expectations. A movie license that not only showed how a first-person shooter could be done right on a home console, but also pushed the genre forward in its own way. GoldenEye was the first first-person shooter to ever pique my interest. It also served as a gateway for getting me into the Bond films. At the time, it was considered a travesty in the Nintendo world when Rare was not developing the game based on Tomorrow Never Dies, and it was going to be a PlayStation game to boot. But Nintendo fans weren't completely out of luck. A Game Boy game simply called James Bond 007 released only half a year after GoldenEye. I remember it being pretty decent, and I would expect that a lot of people did play it, but absolutely no one ever talks about it. So let's revisit James Bond on the Game Boy. James Bond 007 was developed by Utah-based developer Sapphire and released by Nintendo in early 1998. I'm sure many people ignored it because it wasn't something on the level of a handheld GoldenEye, but it does draw inspiration from a very worthy source. Anyone who's played the Game Boy Zelda games will see that the base gameplay is heavily inspired by Link's Awakening a winning formula if ever there was one. The plot is extremely basic. Bond is on a mission to uncover an arms cartel. Starting in China, the game takes 007 to the Middle East, Africa, Tibet, and Russia. What's fun is that despite the game being developed during the Pierce Brosnan era, James Bond on the Game Boy features a non-specific Bond and feels more like the world of the 60s and 70s Bond films. Sure, they could have done better than recycling Odd Job and Jaws as henchmen, and why are they so freaking huge? But all the same, I do get the sense that the developers had fun getting a chance to work in the Bond universe. Bond drops a few lame puns, and there's even some Q-Lab gags. And the music is pretty great. Nothing wrong with overusing the Bond motif, if you ask me. Your first objective is kind of silly and very video gamey. You have to find a carpenter's hammer so he can repair a bridge. Maybe a bit out of place in the world of James Bond, but this is largely a game about gathering information and figuring out how to get what you want out of people. Which is kind of a good idea for a Bond game, don't you think? I mean, sure, Bond has a license to kill, but with most of his games having been shoot-'em-ups of some form or other, this puzzle and mystery-solving element feels like it gets at an important facet of Bond that the shooter format doesn't do as well. In fact, combat is definitely the game's weakest aspect. Though Bond has a pistol and a few other guns, they're a bit difficult to use. You pick up a shield very late in the game, but otherwise there's not much you can do to protect yourself in a gunfight other than awkwardly dodging and abusing hitboxes. Fighting against melee-type enemies is a much more pleasant experience, though a bit too simple to be interesting. Bond's melee weapons are only his fists and a machete, which, interestingly enough, can be used to cut grass, just like in Zelda. Melee is probably the easiest way to fight in most situations, even against enemies with guns. Just equip a bulletproof vest and charge on in, hacking away. It's actually kind of bizarre when you really stop to think about it. 
<laughs> like, really? A machete? That's not very Bond-like. Enemy encounters actually get very difficult and tedious toward the end of the game, and I found that this was the easiest way to cut through. You'd think that Q's gadgets would be just an excellent fit for a Zelda clone, but unfortunately the potential is mostly squandered. New items don't open up the gameplay in any meaningful ways. An electrified keychain is automatically used once in a very specific situation. The laser watch is only useful on a couple of doors, and that's it. There's simply just not much you can do with the majority of your inventory. Bond eventually ends up in Russia, a throwback to the series Cold War era. By this point in my replay, I started to find the game to be so frustrating that I actually had to visit the old Nintendo Power Shelf and whip out issue 105. The later stages just devolved into thoughtless, enemy-filled mazes. Bond finally encounters the Metal Gear riding mastermind behind the arms cartel, General Golgov. Not to be confused with General Gogol of the film. After stopping Golgov's missile launch, Bond takes villain-turned-ally Zhang Mei on a slow boat to China. Despite a promising first half that does a good job of turning the information and mystery-solving aspects of Bond into a simplified Game Boy format, the frustrating second half of the game relies on obtuse mazes and far too much combat for a game that really isn't designed for it but it's those good parts that I mostly remembered from my initial playthrough almost 18 years ago. Sadly, I can't say that it's an unexpected Game Boy gem like I wish I could've, but it certainly does show great potential. I mean, who would've thought, mixing up Bond and Zelda? I think if someone did it better one day, that might be the best Bond game yet. <laughs>